Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Ultraspeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour. Well, I'm sure there's somebody at Intel that is rejoicing this week because AMD CPUs for the last nine years turn out to be vulnerable to some data leak attacks. Now, this story comes to us from Engadget.com. Quote, researchers at Graz University of Technology have detailed a pair of side channel attacks under the takeaway name that can leak data from AMD processors dating back to 2011. Whether it's an old Athlon uh, 64X2 or a Ryzen 7 or even a Threadripper. Now, both exploit uh, the way predictor for the level one cache meant to boost the efficiency of cache access to leak memory content. Now, the L1D cache is a tool that predicts where the data is stored in the processor and detects when that data has been accessed. The Collide Plus probe attack lets an intruder monitor the memory access without having to know the physical address or shared memory, while the Load Plus Reload is a more secretive method that uses shared memory without invalidating the cache line. So to translate this into English for you, processors run a lot of software concurrently, and it's essential for a system security that these simultaneous concurrent processes that are occurring inside of a single processor, or more importantly, in this case, a single processor core, have a way of keeping programs separate so that one program can't see what the other one is doing. Um, This latest research uncovered flaws that allow the data between, uh, to be shared between programs running on the same core. So it kind of works like this. You have some attacking software, some malicious software, And it starts by picking an address corresponding to the target's data address. Then the attacker accesses the data stored in their copy, their version of the address. But that creates a link between the address within the cache and the way of the predictor and the way predictor. Excuse me. If the address is triggered a third time. The processor, I'm sorry, the route the processor will take to access that address list the next time is guaranteed to be fast because it's already happened a single time. But if the address is triggered a third time, then the processor will get to it slowly. So all the attacker has to do is bring up that address at regular intervals and watch for the time it takes for the the processor to respond. Now, if it comes up quick, then the victim has not accessed the data. But if it takes a while, then it has been accessed. And this allows an attacker to monitor when the victim accesses data stored within the processor without actually having to know uh, where that data is and without the requirement of sharing the memory with the victim. So the researchers constructed a covert channel between two pieces of software that were never designed to be able to communicate. And this allowed them to break what's known as ASLR or address space layout randomization, which is part of one of the key steps in accessing processor memory. Uh, From there, they were able to leak kernel data and they were even able to break some AES encryption keys. The team took advantage of flaws using JavaScript in common browsers. Now, this is of note because a lot of times we talk about attacks, they're very theoretical attacks and they require a very specific set of circumstances. Um, So they're cool to talk about from a technical perspective. And of course, there's no such thing as too much security. It's always nice when we can drill down and fix something. But in this case, this does have some real world ramifications. They were able to exploit these flaws using JavaScript in common browsers like Chrome and Firefox, not to mention virtual machines in the cloud. This is something that I keep coming back to time and time again. We talk about self-hosting. We talk about owning your own data. And as it turns out, the the more that we dig into how shared environments actually work, the more we find out that there is a, a, a very predominant threat level that seems to have more and more exploits. 
And so in this case, uh, in AMD's case, the data only, quote unquote, dribbles out a small amount of information compared to Meltdown or Spectre. Um, but that was enough for investigators to access AES encryption keys. It's possible to address the flaw with a mix of hardware and software, the researcher said, although it's not certain how much this would affect performance. Um, yeah, it's it, it. This is this is interesting. You know, as we continue to move down this path of of um, of looking for exploits, we are of course going to find them. Now, there was a bit of controversy that that kicked up over the internet. Um, in that a lot of people were s uh, suspicious because Intel apparently provided some of the funding that was used to uh, to find these exploits. And I want to be clear, these exploits, to the best of my understanding, are far less of a uh, of a of a concern and of and a far less of a hit than you would take with some of the Intel um, vulnerabilities, because to fix the Intel ones, you're looking at a performance at a 50 percent. Um, and that doesn't seem to be the case here. So it, and it also doesn't seem to leak as much memory or as much data. And so from that perspective, AMD is still kind of ahead of the game, but I think it's important to note that these threat vectors exist. We are just now paying people to dig really far to try and find these things and then to try to patch them. There was also some controversy because, um, the, uh, the research team apparently discovered this back in August of 2019 and had tried to alert AMD to this and said, hey, you have some some problems. And of course, this goes through a process called responsible disclosure. The idea being you could, as a security research firm, just spin up a website or a blog and say, here, here's what we found and uh, AMD should fix this. The problem is that information lands in the hands of vicious attackers at the same time that it lands in the lap of the people who would like to fix the vulnerability so that the customers are not affected. And so to combat that, they go through a process called responsible disclosure in which they release those vulnerabilities to the company first and let the company go about the process of saying, okay, now we have a fix in place. Now you can go ahead and go public with this. Um, and so they were, they, you know, the researchers felt like they were dragging their feet and that AMD was very slow to respond. Uh, both concerns, as I looked into them, seemed to be a nothing burger. Uh, yes, Intel did fund, uh, did provide funding for this study, but so did a bunch of other firms uh, about the other large technology companies. And also the money that Intel spent on this particular venture was also uh, spent to try to secure their own, uh, their own processors. They were looking for threats anywhere, not just uh, an AMD threat. It wasn't like they were just sponsoring, um, you know, research to try to get ahead of their competition. I'll, show, I'll like I say, I'm sure there's somebody at Intel that's very happy that they found this. Uh, they're just generally trying to make security better for everybody. Um, and so I, 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 you know, I think this is, again, it's an interesting thing. It's certainly not going to, it certainly still reinforces the idea that we exist in a place in where Ryzen and AMD is a real competitor to Intel. Now, I have talked to a lot of people that work in industry, that work in places like Google and Amazon and eBay, uh, they are not quite as excited about AMD and Ryzen as as the rest of us are on the home user side. Um, when you start getting into the very high level, very mission critical stuff, um, they're not as reliable. And that's what I'm hearing from the people that work on these systems. But they have said that a lot of these larger companies are very much looking to move towards Ryzen because the, the cost for performance is a lot less and they believe that a lot of these shortcomings can be worked out and they want to work them out and they're interested in working them out. Um, and so they're going to continue to go down that path. Uh, but you should just be aware that if, it, it, as it stands today, if you want to play with it in your home or if you have a non-critical production machine that's at work that you use like your daily desktop drive or something like that, that if it crashed, you have all your data backed up, you go to a different machine, you can reinstall, whatever it takes. Um, but if you have critical processes that have to be running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that the industry standard is still Intel and probably will be for some time. As we continue to find additional exploits and the ones that are being found in AMD seem to still pale in comparison to the ones found in Intel, I think we're rapidly going to approach a point where we say, hey, we can get more performance for less money with better security. And if you compare and contrast this article with the one that we covered last week about uh, encrypted memory, you will see that AMD is beginning to is certainly taking the innovative lead in the IT industry, but following very close behind with reliability and performance.
Again, 855-450 NOAH. That's 1855-450-6624. Email live at asknoahshow.com. Kabavik in the chat room says, Oh, I, 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 it's a, there's a conversation occurring in the chat room. I thought maybe it was related to our uh, AMD discussion. Hey, there's a new open source messenger on the market. It's known as Session. Now, this comes to us from ititsfoss.com. Uh, it's a fork of Signal. And I have been a massive proponent of Signal since the day it was released. In fact, I'm a massive proponent of anything from Open Whisper Systems. Signal took what was previously inaccessible technology to average normal people because in order to get proper security there was so many steps involved and so much understanding of key exchanges and private keys and public keys and all this stuff it 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 took all of that away and does all of that for you and pr just provides a very simple intuitive interface that anybody can use to communicate securely um the way that they do the key exchange uh is 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 terrific and it is so cool and so innovative that a bunch of other messaging services to include facebook messenger and uh, whatsapp have incorporated their uh their encryption like schemes and in the case of whatsapp they kind of duplicated it but it's basically the same thing the problem with signal and viber and telegram and you know every other messenger on the face of the planet that offers true private encrypted messaging is they require a phone number and a couple things there. First of all, a phone number is very 1980s, very 1990s of them, right? People don't necessarily have phone numbers anymore. That's number one. Here's number two. You don't necessarily want your phone number tied to some communication that you'd like to be private because in the case of a phone number, it's going to be registered uh, with a telco and that telco has a certain amount of regulations to collect information about the known about the person and so it's very difficult to obtain an anonymous phone number not impossible but very difficult and so those of us that are really interested in complete and total privacy um have always kind of had have always kind of sidestepped the idea of like well i can use signal it, it does provide end-to-end -end encryption it's very secure it's going to be very difficult for anybody to eavesdrop but if anybody ever did find a message or and wanted to trace it back to its origin because signal is tied to to a phone number that is a possibility so it is a threat vector and it would be nice to eliminate and i've always wondered why open whisper systems a company that literally focuses on privacy and security of messages why they tied it to a phone number to begin with my only uh the only thing that i can i can surmise is that in the effort of trying to prevent fraud and abuse and trying to make it so that uh only one person can use signal if it's tied to a phone number the phone number we can be fairly guaranteed cannot be assigned to more than one person not that spoofing a phone number isn't a thing but for the most part the telcos have have been able to provide a way so that when you send uh information to a phone number it arrives there more or less securely and uh, we can have a discussion on signal seven and why that's not as secure as people might think it is but that's a different discussion for a different time session is an open source messenger and a fork of signal um it, the it, it has all of the same fundamental basics of signal but in the case of session it allows you to simply click create account now after you install it on your desktop or phone it will simply generate a random unique session id um, this looks like a random string of numbers and letters and you just share that session id with the contact that you want to add or if you'd like and you that is very obtuse to you, you can also opt to use a QR code scanner after the account creation and you can share that QR code so that people can add you back. Uh, for users that are aware of what blockchain is, they have been waiting for a real world application uh, that average users can utilize. Now we've talked to a couple of banks that are utilizing uh, blockchain technology. Uh, Session is the latest uh, uh, open source application to do the same session is one such example that utilizes blockchain at its course you don't even necessarily need to know it's there it's just there so session just like signal is taking all of the crypto all of the security all of the open source fundamental building blocks that are necessary to create a secure messaging platform and they are uh, they're putting that up where you don't have to look at it you just download the app and use it if you head over to the official download page, you'll be able to download an app image file, which I thought was a pretty cool way to package and release this. In case you have no clue how it works, you literally just double click on it. Um, very useful if you want to get your family on a messaging system. I tried to get my family on Telegram. The problem is I have three small kids. They don't have cell phones, thus they don't have cell phone numbers, thus they can't register for Telegram. Tried to get them on Signal, same story. 
Um, Google offers Duo, which allows you to do some messaging, but I would by no means consider that a secure messaging platform because it's hosted by Google. Um, and so there hasn't really been a great alternative. What I've done up until now is I have self-hosted an XMPP server with the off-the-record plugin, OTR plugin, and uh, and used uh, essentially XMPP clients to to deal with chat so that my kids could could create an account and I could communicate with them. But I would love to use a product like this where I don't have to... There's a lot of things I'm interested in self-hosting. The general day-to-day, -day, hey, I'm just going to send a message to you back and forth. I don't necessarily need to host that. I just want to host the part that keeps it private, which signal and session let me do. I have my private key. My messages are encrypted. They are secret. They are private. I'm good to go. Again, 1-855-450-NOAH. It's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Steve calls from Ontario. Hey, Steve, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hey, Noah. Thanks for uh, taking my call. Yeah, you bet. So um, I had a question about network segregation for IoT. Um, I actually sent an email in just so that you could see some diagrams and stuff like that um, in case I'm not describing it clearly, but I'll give the description kind of a shot here. Um, so what I have currently is I have a PFSense router, and it goes into a gigabit switch, and then the gigabit switch branches off two ways, one way into the Wi-Fi, one way into a 10 gigabit switch um, for servers and such like that. It's completely flat right now. What I'm hoping to achieve, um, and I just have some ideas, and I wasn't sure. I thought this would be something you would have tackled in the past, but ideally I would like to start segregating this a bit where the, the servers and things on the Wi-Fi like laptops and stuff like that, should be able to talk to each other because there are services that I run, such as, you know, a wiki or whatever, that needs to be accessible by laptops or what have you. But I've started to pick up some smart plugs, and I want to start to try and isolate that. And I didn't really have a good way to do this because the devices on the Wi-Fi need to be able to talk to the smart plugs in order to, you know, turn them on and off or whatever. And if right. I get into some sort of home automation, they'll need to talk to it too. So how do I prevent this, the IoT stuff from egressing into the network while still let it, allowing e ingress happen? So you're using fi uh, PFSense as your firewall, yeah? Yep. Okay. Then, And do your switches support VLANs? They don't. Hmm. And you're trying to do this without repurchasing switches, right? Ideally, yes. Um, I also wasn't really sure how the VLAN would handle, like, I'm not overly familiar. So if you, mm -hmm. you know, talk about how VLAN would solve this problem, because as far as I could see, I'm not sure how a VLAN would be allowed to enter another VLAN without return traffic. Right. You, you know what I mean? Like, I, I do. So, so the, the, I'll tell you, I'll just tell you that the cleanest, most straightforward way to solve this problem is this at the PF sense level. You the the PF sense becomes the 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 master of all of the networks, and you define each one of your networks, and you break them out onto a separate VLAN. Um, and so you would have things. Like, so in my house, for example, I have the admin network, which has access to all of my servers and the and the management interfaces for my switches and so on and so forth. I have uh, a VLAN for voice, which is really not necessary anymore, uh, but I still have it for legacy purposes. I have a VLAN for uh, just general you know, family, private traffic that has access to the file server, stuff like that. I have a VLAN for just access to the internet. And then I have a VLAN for IOT, which is, I treat that thing practically like it's infested with COVID-19. Right. Um, and, and the way that, the way that I deal with getting traffic in certain circumstances, not in not others is what's known as inter VLAN routing. And so essentially what you do is you create rules inside of the PF sense that when this IOT device wants to talk to this home automation controller, that, that's fine. It can go in there and it can send traffic and it'll pass it to, to this IP address, but it can't go anywhere else on that, on that uh, you know, family, in my case, family uh, VLAN. It can only talk to the automation server, can't talk to anything else. Um, the IoT devices, of course, have access directly to the gateway so they can get out to the internet and they can do their cloudy thing, but they can't, it can't ever take any information from any of the other devices except the ones that I specify. And so I ran into an issue with my Honeywell thermostat in which the Honeywell thermostat itself 
has some data metrics and stuff that it sends to to uh, to Honeywell. And I was able to say, okay, listen, you Honeywell thermostat, you can go ahead and talk to my home automation controller so I can adjust the temperature. And my phone, which is going through the internet, is going to be able to access that home automation controller so that can talk to the internet. But Honeywell thermostat, you're no longer allowed to talk to the gateway because you send bad things and I don't, I don't, I don't want you sending that information to Honeywell. So the only person you can talk to, the only thing you can talk to is this home automation controller. And I've set that up inside of PFSense uh, with InterVLAN routing. So that's the cleanest way to do it. If you wanted to get away with not buying switches, um, the other thing that you can do, you mentioned in your email here, I see you, you talk about, you say, hey, is there something I could do maybe with VMs? One of the, th one of the other things, and I haven't, I mean, I'm going through this on a phone call, but the other way that you could do it is with something known as router on a stick. And I, there, there should be a way in which you could essentially create a, a, a separate PFSense instance for your, uh, for your IOT stuff and then selectively route packets back into your main PFSense, which has access to your, to your admin network. Um, as to the exact way that that would work out, I haven't fully thought through it. I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my cuff. Um, but, but you know, if, I'm just looking at it from the perspective of if I had two businesses or two office buildings, and I wanted to share uh, certain devices and I wanted them to have certain access to the network, I would be able to create some firewall rules or I could even set up a VPN and create some firewall rules within that VPN to say, these devices can talk to these devices on this network. In fact, we set that up for a clinic. They had a, a PAC system, a image system that was capturing medical images. And what they what the clinic wanted was they wanted to be able for the radiologist's office to access the PAC system, the image network, but they didn't want them to access anything else on the network. And so we created and they wanted it done over a site to site VPN. So we created a site to site VPN and created some firewall rules that basically said when this VPN comes in, it's able to talk to this specific part of the network and nothing else. Um, I also see in your email you talk about doing it with subnets. You can do it with subnets. Just understand that. Um, you know, if I'm sitting on the same physical, if I'm sitting on the f same physical LAN or the same physical VLAN, huh, there's an oxymoron, and I have a device that wants to be malicious, um, it's it's going to keep the honest people honest as long as the Internet of Things device is doing what it's told to do network-wise, that's fine. If one were to ever get compromised, though, and I sit there and I, and I decide I'm going to change what subnet I exist on because I'm an attacker and I have access to this one thing, VLANs will prevent a person from being able to jump or at least to the extent that you haven't set up VLAN routing, we'll be able to prevent them from jumping. If it's just a subnet separation, um, there's nothing stopping somebody from just changing their IP address and their subnet mask to then talk to other devices that you didn't want them to talk to. Sure, that makes sense. Um, so on the idea of a VLAN, yes. how do you handle um, how do you handle the Wi-Fi for that? So my thought is like, the smart plugs are obviously Wi-Fi, and you've got laptops that are Wi-Fi. If you're doing VLAN, mm -hmm. how do you have a, a router, not a router, uh, access an access point. point that doesn't understand VLANs handle all that? Yeah, you wouldn't. You would. Um, you there. There are two possible options. Oh, option A is you can have two access points, and one is on one VLAN and one is on the other. That's obviously not ideal uh, for a number of reasons, but the biggest one being you have a limited amount of RF spectrum to exist inside of your house. And so if you, you know, if you start have to managing two separate entire networks, it gets messy pretty fast. Um, the, the right way to do it, or the clean, again, the cleanest way, I shouldn't say the right way, because there's a number of quote unquote right ways to do it. But the, the cleanest way to do it is to use an access point like the Unify UAPAC Pro that supports VLANs. And the way that that would work is you create a separate SSID for, for each VLAN network. Uh, and so, like, in, at my home, I have family, which allows the access to the family network, and then there's a separate SSID literally called IoT with a stupid simple password because you can't really do anything on it other than get to the Internet. And the purpose of that network is specifically to allow uh, all of the little Wi-Fi devices to get on. Now, as, as it relates to your laptop question, you know, your laptop is going to be connecting to the family uh, SSID, family VLAN, and inside of PFSense, there's going to be rules that say that 
that computer, that client has access to all of the network resources, whereas the IoT VLAN only has access to the internet and some very select resources on our admin network. Um, and and that will that those rules will be the same as if you plugged in a cable on on, on VLAN 30 for in in my case, or if you just connected to the IoT uh, SSID. So here's a here's a related question then for you. Do you need a, a VLAN switch then if you have the if you have an access point that understands VLANs? And the thought is the Wi-Fi stuff would be segregated in the different mm. based on their SSID. But then you could block the the VLAN a certain VLAN from in, ingressing into your the rest of your like wired network. Then, yeah, you yeah, you could. Yeah, that would work. Um, the the only issue I, I and again I it's it's difficult for me to kind of think this out. It's almost something I'd have to sit down and try. But the only thing I'm thinking is with with PFSense. You know, if you use a smaller PFSense box that only has one LAN port on it, the way that that uh, NetGate tells you to. Uh, to, to utilize that with VLANs is you send a, essentially the single LAN jack becomes a trunk port and then you break out your VLANs on your switch. If you, if the PFSense is running multiple VLANs and it's, it's spitting it and that's a trunk port into a switch, if it's an unmanaged switch, then your, then the other clients wouldn't know which VLAN to associate with. So you'd never be able to plug anything into the switch unless it was something like you say, an access point that separated back out, but that switch is only going to be a trunk switch. Uh, anytime, if you had any wired clients, you'd have to come up with either, you'd either have to have a second port on your PFSense router, or you'd have to have a switch that can, um, handle VLAN traffic. Interesting. Okay. That gives me something to think about. Um, if you have any links that you think would be helpful, I would, uh, appreciate them being checked in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. You bet. I will include them in there. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks for your t- thanks for the call. 8185450 Noah. That's 8554506624. The email live at asknoahshow.com. That's the that's the number to make your voice heard, add your voice to the conversation. I'll say this about VLANs and 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 networking technology in general. I, we I have my own concerns about Unify and their privacy. I really do. And I we talk about them on the show. I try to be as upfront and honest as I as I can be. But here's the truth. Prior to the past, you know, maybe seven, eight years ago, we did not have access to this kind of technology. If Steve wants to go out and in, in and, and and purchase the equipment that he's going to need to do this, you can pick up a switch that that supports VLAN traffic from Unify for a hundred dollars. You can buy a TP Link switch that supports VLAN traffic for like fifty dollars. You can go buy a used Cisco switch that supports VLAN traffic for like a hundred dollars, and you can buy a brand new UAP AC Pro that supports. Uh, 80211 um, AC and has VLAN support for like 150 bucks. The this is closing the technology divide undisputedly, and they're doing a fantastic job. And so, uh, you know, for all of the privacy problems that we have with Unify and all of the complaints that I have with Unify, the truth is that they have fundamentally opened the IT market and the network market up to people such that anybody can do these things. And I also, one other thing I want to get in here. When you're, I don't, I have a problem with the internet of things from the standpoint that I don't like privacy being violated, but the way that Steve is going about approaching this problem is the way that you should go about approaching this problem. If you want to use a smart plug because it has a nice API and ties nicely into the system that you're, you want to use and it solves a problem for you, go ahead and do that. Go ahead and do that. Just put some time and thought into like Steve is doing as to how can I implement this in a way that my house is not going to get railroaded uh, with privacy violations? How can I do this in such a way that the manufacturer isn't going to get all of this information? Again, I love my Honeywell Redlink system. I really do. The system talks internally uh, over RF. It does nothing else. But the truth is that they, because Honeywell is a company like every other company and they make their money off of data metrics, they have gotten to a point where they have their little internet connected gateway tries to send information out. And so I'm smarter than that. I'm 10% smarter than the device I'm trying to operate. And so I just tell it, you're not allowed to do that. Open phones this hour, 1-855-450-NOAA. That's 1-855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Now we talk all the time on this program 
about self-hosting resources and servers, and we try to get you guys started on that. One of the things that I run into, and I get this question a lot actually, is, well, no, what should I self-host? What should I start with? Um, we talk about the mechanics of getting a virtual server set up, a virtual host set up. We get questions on what hardware to use and what software to use. But then it comes down to what problems are you actually trying to solve? Well, there's a number of different really good solid starting points like C-File or NextCloud or Plex or MB or Jellyfin. Um, those are some of the go-to standards because it's one of the, some of the most popular things that people self-host. But oftentimes the way that I find most efficiently to get into I want to self-host something is look at the products and services you already use and see if there's a way to get off of them. Some of them are pretty obvious, like Google Play services, like self-hosted calendar, self-hosted email. By the way, you should never do that, at least self-hosted email. But other solutions like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube seem like they're not, it's not really possible to self-host. And there's a site out there, there's a new site out there that is showing alternatives for people who want to open or want to want to self-host and that site is open source dot builders find open source alternatives for your favorite apps and this is a really well put together site now anybody that has existed in linux for any length of time if you've come from a windows environment you've probably heard of os alt and it's a fairly decent site but it has all of the obvious alternatives and things that quite frankly come almost pre-installed on your computer because they're such an obvious alternative to the things that you have to use on Microsoft Windows. Well, open source builders is, is very different in that they have modern up-to-date alternatives on some of the biggest services out there. Things like Slack, Shopify, Google Analytics, Heroku, uh, GitHub, 1Password, Amazon S3. You know, these are some of the things that people, I, I don't think it really dawns on most of us that we could host a copy of S3 or an alternative to S3. Salesforce, Google Docs, Zendesk. Right at AltaSpeed right now, we are going through testing various different kinds of open source ticket systems. We've been on OS Ticket for as long as I can remember. But there are some really cool alternatives out there that have started to show a lot of promise. Um, and I'm not hot to trot to dump OS Ticket by any stretch of the imagination. But I have to say, I had our staff spin up uh, a copy as a mod and was taking a look at that, and it, it's pretty cool, along with Helpy uh, and UV Desk are some of the ones that we're looking at, and these are all alternatives that are listed on opensource.builders. They also have alternatives for Google Drive, cPanel, Trello, uh, Intercom, YouTube, Zapper, Zapier, Typeform, Facebook, Instagram. I mean, how, many, how many people think about hosting their own instance of an Instagram alternative? It's a great way to share pictures. It just sucks that Instagram and thus Facebook has access to all of them and stores all of them. And so if you are, if you have any interest in self-hosting, again, it can be kind of a daunting thing to get started because you don't really know where to start. And so my suggestion is keep a, keep a journal. Just keep, pay attention to what you use throughout the day. Hey, I jump on Facebook. Then I go check my email over here. Then I check my calendar over there. And then I use this service to send pictures of my cute kids to my wife. And slowly, one by one, Start moving those things over to a self-hosted alternative. And it's getting easier and easier with the advent of things like DigitalOcean, with the advent of things like Cockpit and Libvert, it ha we've gotten to a point now where anybody on almost any hardware can self-host. A lot of these programs do not require a lot of system horsepower. They just require a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of time to set it up. And over the radio station, I was working last week. They have a, a very elaborate system, a content um, ingest system, I guess you could call it, that ingest content and then organizes and spits it out, some proprietary system. And using a number of different open source tools that I piecemeal together, I was able to build a better functioning system that actually had more features than the proprietary system, was more automated, cost less money, and there's no vendor lock-in. And it's because I've become aware of all of these self-hosted services. So if you have any interest in getting started with self-hosting, you don't know where to start, head over to open source builders, uh, open source, excuse me, dot builders and check out some of their open source alternative to popular apps. Again, open phones, 1-855-450-NOAA. That's 1-855-450-6624. The email, 
live at asknoahshow.com. Make your voice heard, become a part of the program. For the longest time on this program, I have said that one of the reasons I don't like iOS or Android, but one of the reasons that I fall down a little less hard on Android than I do iOS is because at the end of the day, Android at least approaches the mobile market sphere the same way that we were approaching the desktop market sphere back in the 90s, which that is to say one manufacturer, one company makes a hardware device. Another company like Microsoft makes software to load on that device. And because the hardware vendor has no particular interest in the software vendor, except for that, they are able to sell their hardware because there's software to go on it. It's a nice symbiotic relationship, but it leaves room for an open source alternative to come in, thus Linux. And I don't believe that Linux would have ever succeeded if the original personal computer was made by Microsoft and Microsoft took the same approach to their hardware that Apple has taken to their hardware, where you buy a product and a service and the software is loaded onto the, onto the device. Now, certainly we were at, uh, at scale. We were talking about the uh, the um, the SanDisk, the little MP3 player, and I had a friend that was with me, and he had one of those MP3 players, and it wasn't working correctly, and so we went and found some open source alternative firmware that he could load onto the SanDisk player. Totally changed his perception of the SanDisk player. It was fantastic. Everything worked great. Uh, it stopped crashing on him. This was fantastic. And certainly, I think we would have gone that direction um, with a lot of a lot of pieces of technology had we not had an open market to begin with, but it certainly wouldn't have been as easy. And one of the reasons that I, again, fall down a little less hard on Android is because Android manufacturers approach the very similar way. Samsung really doesn't like Android, I don't think. And the evidence of that is if you go buy a Note 9 and look at the software that's on it, they want to replace the Google Assistant with Bixby and they want to replace the calendar app with their own calendar app. They want to replace the contact app with their contact app. They're constantly playing with alternative ROMs and alternative operating systems and alternative ways that you can utilize your Samsung phone. They want to sell a phone. They don't necessarily want to sell Android. I don't think they necessarily like being tied at the hip to Android, but I also don't think they have the clout um, or the following to be able to go off on their own and invent a new operating system and have people follow them, right? It's all about apps. Uh, and so I, I appreciate the fact, though, that when you have Lineage OS and when you have Copperhead OS and when you have things like Sailfish, those projects are possible specifically because the manufacturers don't care what software is on it. They just want to sell phones. Sony has taken that to the extent that they sell an open devices platform. They literally sell a device that anybody can load whatever software they want to, and Sony will support it. They put all the firmware up on the internet right on their site and all of the unlock codes right on their site so you can just unlock the bootloader, load whatever you want on it. Well, there's a new project out. It's called Android for your iPhone. It's called Project Sandcastle. Now, the iPhone restricts users to operate inside of a sandbox, but when you buy an iPhone, you own the iPhone hardware. And Android for the iPhone gives you the freedom to run a different operating system on that hardware. Android for the iPhone has many exciting practical applications. They are talking about using it for things like forensic research, for dual booting devices, and combating e-waste. Consider this, right? The iPhone hardware is pretty good, and it runs for a very long time, even on iOS itself. But once iOS reaches the end of its life, you run into weird problems. I was working with a client a few weeks ago. And he had an iPad and the iPad was a few years old and everything was working exactly the way he wanted it to work. He was able to watch Netflix. He was able to watch his CBS app and a couple of other things, browse Facebook. What happened was he ran into an issue with his iPad and took it to the Apple store and they reset his iPad. Well, when they reset his iPad, he went to reinstall some of these apps, namely the Netflix app and CBS app. And he wasn't able to do so. It said that the Netflix app was no longer supported. And so what had happened was Netflix had released a newer version of the app because the older version of the app was installed previously and worked just fine. He was able to continue to use it and hadn't realized that he had passed this superficial threshold where all of a sudden now he's not allowed to use his programs anymore. Comes to me and says, do you know any way to sideload this application back on? We tried a couple of things. We were unsuccessful. We weren't able to help him 
but it got me thinking when I came across when I came across Project Sandcastle, which, by the way, you can find more at projectsandcastle.org. What if I would have said, hey, there's an alternative ROM you can load onto your your iPad, your three or four year old iPad. It wasn't that old. Uh, this older iPad that uh, still has plenty of life left in it. Hardware wise just isn't capable of running the newest version of iOS and thus the applications that you want to run. What would he have said? What would he have done? And that could have been a real solution. Instead, that iPad is unlikely is likely going to wind up in the trash bin. It has become e-waste. And so this is a very exciting project to me. It's something that I think has been lacking in the in the iOS Apple world for a long time. I think there's a lot of people who would like to play with those phones more to their potential. And this isn't true worldwide, and I understand that. Worldwide, I understand that there it's something like 90% Android dominant, but here inside of the US of A's, we are very, very heavily Apple products, right? You walk around an airport and I'll bet you it's seven to one that you see iPhones to Android. I mean, it's it's rare that I see somebody with an Android phone. It really is, except in the tech community. They all have Androids. But you walk around, the average, the average person gets an iPhone. That means that there's a lot of used iPhones. And then the other part of that is they cycle them every two or three years. So we have a lot of Apple products, and if we can find a way to start to load other alternative operating systems onto uh, these devices, we are going to drastically extend their life. And also, frankly, we are going to start to incorporate open source values into the Apple ecosystem. And who knows, maybe Apple will look up and say, well, some of these alternatives are pretty cool, and maybe we should start incorporating some of this stuff. My understanding is a lot of the features that come into iOS actually came from people that jailbroke their iPhone and started to incorporate different features. Apple looked over and said, hey, hire that guy. He's doing a good job. I, we like what he's doing. So who knows what could happen? Again, 855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. You can add your voice to the conversation, make your voice heard. Freenas. I don't have enough positive things to say about pre Freenas. It started when I had an issue with one of my drives that I had installed in Freenas. Some of you have heard this story a couple of years ago. And I call Ellen Jude and I, in a panic, Alan, my drive is dying. I don't know what to do. You told me to install this Freenas thing. What do I do? Well, just order a new drive and replace it and then click the button. And I said, well, okay. All right. So I order this new drive. I set aside an entire day. Call him back. Hey, what am I going to do now? Well, did you replace the drive and click the button? I said, no, I was going to call you. I want to make sure I'm doing this right. So I'm, I'm, I'm take the drive out. I put the new drive in. Now what? Click the button. Click on the button. Does it say resilving? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Okay. Wait. Now your data's good. Go back to work. It was a five minute process. I mean, what would have taken me an entire day on most other systems when you start, when you have, you know, drives that are dying and uh, I had that happened with a Dell perk card. And in the process of trying to replace the drive, the little CMOS battery died. It lost the entire configuration of the RAID card, turned into a gigantic mess. Some of you may not be aware that iX Systems actually has two variants of FreeNAS. The first is FreeNAS, and that's what we talk about, and we use it for all of our customers. But there is a upper tier, an upper echelon of FreeNAS known as TrueNAS. And TrueNAS is a separate but related open source storage product specifically designed for enterprise and free NAS being the open source free version with expert community um, support has led to the pursuit of innovations like plugins and VMs, so on and so forth. But true NAS is the enterprise version for organizations of all size that need additional uptime and performance, and they need enterprise grade support. Uh, and, and they're going to run mission critical data and applications for that. IX system has to run on specific hardware so that they can understand all of the ins and outs and understand all of the variables and from the beginning, IX Systems, uh, this is from their site, from the beginnings, quote, IX Systems, we've developed, tested, and documented, released both separate products, even though the vast majority of code is shared. This was a deliberate technical decision, but from the beginning and over time, it became less of a necessity and more of just how we've always done it. Furthermore, to change, to change it, it was going to require some serious overall on how to build, package both products. Among other things, we continued to kick the can down the road. As we made a systematic improvements to the development and QA efficiency over the past few years, the redundant release process became almost impossible to ignore. So our next major efficiency roadblock to overcome, we finally rolled up our sleeves. With the release of 
the latter half of the year, we will not only bring more features and improvements than any other release that has come before it, but we will unify both products into a single software image name. This shift will have great many benefits for our users, but before we can go into further detail, we'd like to first reassure you that there are no plans to stop releasing a free version, close the source, or limit features. We just want to make sure to get that out of the way before we go on. Now, I am going to tell you what all of the cool, well, actually, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, somebody else is going to tell you what all of the cool features that they are, that they are, and why they have made this decision are coming up. Uh, I actually had a chance to meet up with the fine folks of FreeNAS at scale this year. And we were able to sit down with uh, their salespeople and ask them, why did you make this change? Because at first, uh, you know, when, I, when the news first broke, I thought, this is kind of cool. And then I started to dig into it. I thought, this is really cool because this is going to make the transition from FreeNAS to TrueNAS much easier. Here's that interview audio. I'm here with Matt Finney. He's the director of sales and marketing for iX Systems, and I had to approach to ask about this recent name change. So, Matt, let's start with this. Um, some most people are familiar with FreeNAS. Probably most people, at least listeners of this program, are running FreeNAS because I've told them to. Um, what is the difference between FreeNAS and TrueNAS to begin with? Well, FreeNAS and TrueNAS. The primary difference is TrueNAS is really the enterprise version of FreeNAS. So it's sold as an enterprise appliance. Takes all the best pieces of FreeNAS the rock, stabi rock solid stability that you're used to um, and effectively turns it into an enterprise appliance giving you functionality like high availability, uh, hypervisor certifications and a, a price point that's really appealing compared to a number of the other tier one storage vendors out there. And you're not going to be able to run that on just any hardware. That's something that is going to have to be very specific. Um, is, is, is that one of the other things that separates TrueNAS and is that something people need to take into consideration? Well, TrueNAS, the enterprise platform, it is an appliance, and so we need to make sure we know what hardware is being run so that we can support it appropriately and get the performance that we would expect from the system. As you're moving in uh, to 2020, you guys have decided on a name change. Talk about that. What is the name change, and why did you choose to go down that route? Well, the name change is really merging FreeNAS and TrueNAS into a single family of products, which is going to be called TrueNAS Open Storage. Um, there's a number of benefits, I mean, both to our users and to iX systems. Uh, but first off, if our, if our users didn't realize this, we actually used to have two separate images of the software. They would share most of the same source code, but we actually had to maintain two separate images of the software. Uh, with uh, TrueNAS Core being released, uh, TrueNAS Core 12.0, when that is released later this year, we're actually going to share the same image across uh, TrueNAS Core and TrueNAS Enterprise. So there's going to be a lot of efficiencies gained with NIX to just maintain one software image. It's going to allow our testing process to be a lot better and more efficient. Um, and then in terms of just brand recognition, unifying the two brands, it'll be a simpler conversation of if customers are using TrueNAS Core or TrueNAS Enterprise. What if I just really like seeing FreeNAS when I log into my web UI? What if it just makes me feel very comfortable and I've seen it for so many years? Do you have anything for me? Absolutely. Actually, you'll still be able to switch the, uh, the icon back to, to FreeNAS when we initially launched the TrueNAS uh, open storage family. When you, let's say you start with TrueNAS Core and you start with the free version and you've built up, what are the UI differences going to be between TrueNAS Core and the, and the TrueNAS uh, Enterprise solution? If you're comfortable with TrueNAS Core, TrueNAS Enterprise is going to look very similar. It's going to be the same underlying image. The main difference would be things like the high availability functionality um, that's added in the TrueNAS Enterprise uh, appliance. Talk about that high availability. How are you achieving that in a, from a hardware standpoint? Well, we do a single uh, either 2U or 4U enclosure. We have dual controllers. They're both independent controllers. Those controllers are linked together via a uh, basically a PCIe link between the controllers, redundant power supply. So you can think of it as in a single enclosure, a fully redund redundant without a single point of failure uh, solution. That's a pretty cool piece of hardware, and like you say, um, people are able to get their hands on that for far less than they would from other storage providers, but it's not just storage. You guys do a lot of custom servers. Talk about that. Yeah, so a big part of our business for uh, folks that didn't know this, we 
actually started as a system integrator, so it's one of the reasons we decided to manufacture and build the uh, TrueNAS appliance ourselves, because we've been building servers uh, for just general purpose server needs, Hadoop clusters, uh, VMware host servers for you know 20 plus years at this point. Uh, so it's a big part of our business and something that we still do uh, a lot of today. What software are you guys using to run the, high, the virtualization host? It's really up to the customer in that, in that scenario. So on the server side of our business, uh, customers can choose what application they want to run and we'll design a solution for them. Is FreeNAS or TrueNAS, TrueNAS Core, are any of those being used as a virtualization host? They can be, and so you, we, you can integrate effectively Beehive uh, VMs within uh, FreeNAS or TrueNAS on either of the products coming up. So you can run VMs on, our, on either our uh, TrueNAS Core platform in the near future or uh, TrueNAS Enterprise. What is True Command and how is that beneficial? Uh, so True Command is really exciting. Uh, think of it as you could have a single pane of glass management. So True, True Command is a single pane of glass UI to manage multiple FreeNAS, TrueNAS, or in the near future, TrueNAS Core or TrueNAS Enterprise systems. So we wanted to have that platform where uh, you could have our open source users, but maybe they have an enterprise need, um, or maybe they want to replicate between our, our TrueNAS Enterprise and the TrueNAS Core open source uh, solution. And True Command allows you to basically uh, manage all of those systems from the same UI. So it's designed to work with both the free open source version and the enterprise version because we have users that use both. How difficult is that for somebody to get set up and what is the cost associated with True Command? Good news for True Command, uh, just keeping to our open source uh, mentality and wanting to make sure that we're offering free solutions for our customers. True Command is free to use um, up to 50 hard drives. So you can manage, uh, say you had five 10 drive uh, free NAS systems, you could manage those all for free under True Command. Once you get past 50 drives, we do licensing for 100 drive licenses, so it can scale you know, as large as you need it to go. Matt Finney, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. We appreciate the work that you guys are doing at IX Systems, and we appreciate the fact that you are trying to streamline your products, make it easier for the end user. Absolutely love everything you guys are doing. We'll get you back on the program real soon. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thanks. A huge thanks to Matt Finney for taking the time to chat with us at scale. And a huge thanks to everybody who came out to our meetup and uh, and hung out. And, of course, a huge thanks to Michael Hall for setting up gettogether.community, a great community resource and the thing that we use to schedule the meetups. Now, a couple of things before we get out of here. Uh, our scale interviews are going to be available on our Mind Drip Media YouTube channel. That's a channel where we release our video-focused content, so we invite you to check that out. Of course, we'll have links in the show notes at podcast.asknoah.com. A show.com. Uh, also, we are finished uploading our Red Hat Summit interviews. Those are, will be available uh, there as well, um, as well as our future how-to tutorials, those kinds of things. So please make sure to check that out. Now, as of today, there is a call for speakers at South East Linux Fest, my probably my favorite conference to attend. Now, you can find out more at southeastlinuxfest.org, but the announcement says that they are looking for a call for speakers. So if you have an interest in speaking, I highly recommend you come out and hang out. We have a, we, That's the largest production that we do. We, uh, we set up a big table. We stream the event. Uh, we do a live show right from the show floor. We get interviews. It's a great time. One of the best community events out there. Now, we've been asked by an increasing number of people if we'll be holding, or uh, excuse me, this from their side. We've been asked by an increasing number of people if we'll be holding self due to the coronavirus outbreak as several major sporting events are already canceled or being held in empty arenas. In addition, there are confirmed coronavirus cases in the greater Charlotte region, including several people who have tested positive and were unaware that they were positive while transiting through Charlotte Douglas International Airport. Despite this, we do not anticipate any disruption to the self 2020 event from COVID-19. Few things to keep in mind, they say. COVID-19 is similar in transmission to in seriousness to a bad seasonal flu. So we expect like the seasonal flu to have to have it ease up with warmer weather and we expect June in North Carolina to be very very warm. If you're at risk, by all means stay home. In the unlikely event that COVID-19 is still kicking around by the time self happens, we'll be make sure to have stockpiles of disinfectant, hand cleaning supplies, and make readily available throughout the conference venue. The same common sense practice applies. Do always 
uh, do apply to reduce the transmission. Cover your coughs, your sneezes, wash your hands frequently, and always wash your hands before touching your face. And I'll add in there, or eating. Uh, I just got back from scale, met with a bunch of people, hung out with a bunch of people. As far as I know, none of us have coronavirus. So, uh, yeah, you should definitely not let coronavirus prevent you from coming to self 2020 hey that's it for this episode of the ask noah show we'll be back next week with more information head over to wiki.linuxdelta.com we've got a lot of great submissions we're still asking people to come on there i had a couple of people send some emails asking hey can you pull site content from my site yes absolutely send the email to live at asknoahshow.com if you don't have time uh to go on and create it just send it we'll have one of our producers do it the ask noah show continues next tuesday at 6 p.m central huge thanks to sarah our call screener jtr producer this hour of the show may be or there's plenty more content for you at asknoahshow.com we'll see you next week